Hello again. Good morning. Um, when I think about uh, the question of is technology going to replace human work or is it going to complement human work, what I keep coming back to is the fact that it's 2019, almost 2020, the economy has never been more technologically advanced and the unemployment rate is 3.5%, which means that in all likelihood, the future of technology times human labor is going to be technology working alongside human workers. And that's why I'm really excited here to be talking uh, to a couple of technologists and, technolog and technology thinkers about how uh, automation and, and AI could potentially uh, enhance uh, our work. Um, Maria, I want to start with you. Uh, you work at Oculus for Business um, within Facebook. Uh, when Facebook first bought Oculus, the virtual reality startup, um, I assumed that they were going to develop VR games, that the newsfeed was going to be some sort of VR reality in front of my head. Um, Oculus for Business is not an implication that immediately came to mind. So tell me a little bit about what you're working on and the, the promise that you see o that Oculus having uh, for companies. Uh, from the very start, when uh, Oculus uh, was acquired, and, and, and even from the founders, uh, we saw VR as a generic computing platform, so where you will have use cases for gaming, entertainment, but also for work, um, similar to what a laptop can do today. Uh, so it was really pretty obvious that uh, there will be those use cases in the future. Um, we, we, was, we were waiting for the right timing. Um, our Oculus uh, headsets Rift were tethered to a PC. They were very difficult with mobility, and when we launched Oculus Quest uh, earlier in May, that was the time where the headsets became really portable and really usable in, in workspaces. So this is where we saw the, 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 t the ticking off of this technology. We also had a lot of demand. So we saw people who were um, visionaries of uh, virtual reality that they were taking the technology and just using it for work. And they come into us like, help us. We need help this technology works. So the starting points of really return of investment kept coming, and we decided that it was the right time to do it. Now, in terms of use cases that we see taking off right now, um, two that are in the immediate and one that is like very promising for the future. Uh, the two in the immediate uh, are immersive training. So for those of you who don't know virtual reality or haven't experienced that much, uh, virtual reality has the magic of teletransport you where you are. Uh, through what you see in the headset, your head moves what you're looking at and you see your hands. So that creates that the brain actually believes that you are there. So if you are doing a training, you're actually doing it for real. So you learn by doing. So it has like 10x improvements of how you traditionally learn. Uh, the other magic of VR is that now all your environment around you is software. So you can recreate any environment. You can do it as many times as you want. It's a safe place. So it's great for training use cases. The other use case that is really proving amazing ROI is uh, design and anything that has to do with collaborative 3D forms. Uh, before, in automotive, for example, creating a car or designing a car used to take like years and a lot of millions of dollars to create those models. Right now, you can do that all in software, immediately put people in there, comment, create a new version, et cetera, et cetera. So those are like short term that we see right now. Um, a little bit longer time, we see collaboration really being a game changer uh, for the future of work. Uh, nobody likes to commute. Nobody likes to business travel. I mean, I love you all, but I've spent <laughs> 10 hours in a plane to come from the West Coast here to talk to you. I wish that I could be at my home with a new, we received a new couch yesterday, and I would like to be with it's my nice family to, to try <laughs> it, and I can't because I'm here. Um, so this is like some of the, and also like another thing, I'm from Spain. I would love to be back in Spain for Christmas with my family and not have to like, you know, go back and forth and not being with them. So these are some of the fundamental things that we think that we can change with virtual reality. And the ability of virtual reality, that what, what the game changing is that today, remote work, the two main problems that you have is one is the tools that we have are not sufficient. You can't limit a face-to-face -face collaboration in an, in, in an 18 inch screen. There's just not enough space. You wanna share documents, you wanna see a video call, like it just doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. Virtual reality gives you that space where you can actually communicate that shared context. Um, the other reason is that you know, people, when they, when they work in remote, they feel very lonely, they're very isolated because you don't get like that vibe of what's going on in the office. Virtual reality and a company like Facebook and Oculus can connect people and can help you through that isolation. So we are super excited about the future of collaboration. That's great. 
Igor, uh, several years ago, you sold a startup, Yap, to Amazon that formed one of the basis, bases of their technology, Alexa. You're now developing a new startup that, when I was reading about it, seemed a little bit like Alexa, but for offices. It's currently in secret mode, so you might not be able to say that much about it, but give me at least an elevator pitch about this technology and how you see it changing the office of the future. So I think, um, so Prion was the code name for the engine that became Alexa. Uh, so a little bit of trivia for all of you. Um, th think about the vast quantities of content uh, that, that we have to deal with on a daily basis and it'll just grow in the next uh, five years or so. In fact, um, some predictions are uh, that we read about 250 pages of text per day today. It takes us about four hours. And in the next five years, that's going to go up by 10x, which is astronomical. Imagine trying to read 2,500 pages per day, which is the equivalent of 40 hours of, of reading. That's not human scale anymore. So today, it's 10% machine power and 90% human effort that's going to have to invert in the next five years. And that's everywhere in the Fortune 500 and, and, and beyond, in, in every um, uh, job type you can think of. So we're attacking uh, that problem. Um, in fact, when we brief um, uh, some of these uh, chief medical officers of different hospital systems and the like, they actually correct us that the content that they have to keep up with is doubling in size every 73 days. And so when you think that, we have to throw away the way that these AI assistants are designed today and, and, and how they're trained and, and how they're fed and how they're secured for a totally new architecture, and, and we started the company to, to, to start that work. Right, I want to understand how if I'm working in an office alongside something that for the moment we'll just think of as Alexa for the office, um, how it can read for me. Because I understand how I understand, if that makes sense. I know how I process information. I don't trust any other human being, much less a technology, to properly synthesize for me data that I haven't encountered yet. So how would this work in an office setting? Okay, so the, the biggest hint that I'm willing to give you is, would you trust yourself, though? Would I trust myself? Yes, okay. I think so. So I found a way to make you. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> as, I, as, I, as I come back down to earth. Um, <laughs> Meredith, hello. Uh, you, you've been on... Uh, my podcast, Crazy Genius, um, appearing as a, as a skeptic of technology. Um, before we get to your skepticism, I want to ask a question that elicits a bit of techno-optimism. What are problems that you see existing in the office place of 2019 that you think automation and AI can solve and should solve? So I, I do a lot of work about what are the, uh, the inner workings and the outer limits of technology. And the problems in the workplace that I'm really enthusiastic about solving with technology are very mundane, right? So automating the things like uh, processing receipts or automating uh, filling out forms so you don't have to fill out the same form a hundred times. These are great applications of technology. Uh, I think the problem we run into is when we start imagining that technology is going to do more than it's capable of, when we start imagining that we're going to totally replace humans with computers. Uh, so I have a book called Artificial Unintelligence where I write about this idea called techno-chauvinism, the idea that technology is superior to humans. Uh, and so I think the big idea is we should think about what is the right tool for the task. Sometimes the right tool is a computer, and sometimes it's a human, and what is not better than the other. Yeah. How do you think about, when you think about the possibility of virtual reality in the office place, I mean, clearly it can do some things like literally giving you more space to create, and it can put you in touch with people who are not physically in front of you. Um, in your research, have you confronted any possible complications or downsides with the introduction of VR in the office place? So I'm really enthusiastic about video conferencing. Uh, I have video conference with, uh, with my nephew, who's seven months old, and he tries to like eat the phone, and it's just the most adorable thing in the world. I'm thrilled that it is there. Uh, one of the things that happens in VR situations, though, uh, for me at least, is I get nauseous. Uh, there is a correlation between uh, people who experience motion sickness and people who experience VR sickness. 
Uh, when I tried the Google Glass, I had a migraine for two days. Uh, when I do, uh, you know, the times I've tried Oculus, it makes me want to vomit. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> We'll talk about no. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so I think it's dangerous to uh, assume that, say, all training applications are going to go over to VR. I think we need to, uh, it's great to have the VR applications, but also we're still going to need to do the real world training as well because technologies don't work for everybody. Mm -hmm. You can't just write it once and run it anywhere when it comes to people. Maria, I want to give you a chance to respond to this. Connectivity, obviously, is awesome. Vomiting, obviously, is not. How do we, <laughs> how do we think about developing a technology that might incur, for some part of the population, motion sickness if it's going to be a really important element in the future of telecommuting or uh, conferencing in general? Yeah, I, I mean, technology evolves, and VR has evolved very, very quickly. If somebody did a VR demo like a few years ago or with some of the devices that are not really that good, uh, fr this is like highly technical, but like the frames per seconds that you get to refresh the screen and things like that, all that had an amazing like, impact in how you experience VR. Some people tell me, oh yeah, I did VR and I used like this carbon, like carton thing. And I'm like, no, you didn't do VR. <laughs> like that's not VR. Um, so th there are like differences. Um, you know. We, the way we see it is that technology will get where, where it needs to be. It's, and it's all, it's, there's many ergonomic things. Like it's still, today they are bulky, they're gonna get smaller, they're gonna get thinner, they're gonna get lighter, they're gonna get like amazing resolution. And then you will ask like, you know, when you do a training today, does everybody has to do like face, you know, face-to-face -face training or can people do a training online? Well, did people adopt that training online? Mm -hmm. And training in VR, it's gonna be, a hundred times better than training on the web or training face to face. So people will get there because that's the way technology works. When you have something that is 10x, 100x better than what you used to do, like the pieces come together to get there. And in a way, it seems to me that as VR becomes more realistic, then VR, the, the gap between VR and AR, augmented reality, yes. might shrink. And just does someone suffering from motion sickness have the same issues with augmented reality, or is it, is it a little bit? Uh, more doable I in, mean, the, in the I, AR landscape. I like AR better than VR. I feel like it's less, uh, it, it kind of requires less of me. Mm -hmm. um, I did a really fun project uh, many years ago um, <clears throat> with Google uh, through an organization I worked with called Hidden City Philadelphia, where we had written about uh, kind of the hidden histories of all of these buildings in Philadelphia. And so you could use this app called Google Field Trip and you could use the AR feature to say, I am at this building, and then the content that we had generated at Hidden City would pop up through the field trip app. So applications like this are fantastic for museums. AR, uh, I think, has a lot of possibilities. Um, yeah, museums, cultural tourism in general, I'm really excited about the options for Very AR. Cool. Igor, um, when I think about a technology that doesn't necessarily exist yet, I sometimes divide my sort of perspective thinking into two categories. One category is, if this technology doesn't work so well, then what? And the other category is, if this technology works exactly as predicted, then what? So I want to ask you the second half of that question. Let's say that uh, Prion works exactly as you intended and that it increases by an order of magnitude the amount of information that the typical person in this room can consume and process and synthesize every single day for the rest of their lives. What then? How does that change the future of work? What are the kinds of jobs and tasks and opportunities would exist for us in that future that don't necessarily exist for us today? Okay, so let me, let me actually take it in two parts because the technology does exist. I carry it in my pocket every day. <laughs> in fact, I had baby Alexa, which was cuter than baby Yoda in my hands <laughs> in 2007. And it was actually secretly installed on a prototype iPhone. That's how early the Apple mm -hmm. folks were working with us to, to figure out these uh, assistants that were coming in the pre-Siri uh, days. So we're, we're starting to experiment and place them and take them through, uh, through different uh, corporate trials now. And some of the different examples that we've seen where I am excited about the intersection between our work and AR platforms, for instance, is that we have an aging blue-collar workforce and so most folks that own utilities 
or engines or, or airlines and things of that sort are like, how do we capture all of these all of these things for how these people take care of the world around us and, and, and turn it into something that we can give to the next generation that's going to be caretaking uh, this equipment f uh, for all of us. It's a very effective platform in order, in order to do that. Um, but you have to do it in a way, and, and this is you know, what I typically say about the evolution of technology. You know, in the last 10, 20, 30 years, some of us did what? We, we figured out how to talk like machines. Mathematics, computer science, ones and zeros, assembly code, all of this good stuff. All the programming languages. You know, there, so it was left to a relatively small percentage of us that knew how to, how to instruct these machines. With, with human language technologies, that inverted. With AI, that inverted. Now the machines conform to you. Their, their eye tracking, head tracking, gesture recognition, speech recognition. Now you can just be your normal self and yet still operate this machinery. So the fact that these people don't have to change their behavior, they can still do the things that they need to do, and yet that would instruct a machine to instruct somebody else, that's going to be a huge uh, you know, breakthrough for folks. Interesting. And, and the last thought is companies shouldn't act like companies anymore. If you want to survive and thrive to the transition, you have to operate like an intelligence agency. You know, with all this IoT stuff and everything else, you have to know what your whole system is doing, what your whole ecosystem is doing, and yet figure out how to, how to relay that knowledge to your staff. That's what these technologies will allow you to do in the next half decade. Just a bit more on that last thing that you said, companies of the future shouldn't behave like companies, they should behave like intelligence agencies. What, what does that mean functionally for how a company today would change its operations? Well, I think they have, they have all these sensors on engines. They have all of these things in collaboration tools. They're going to be able to measure the world around them, all the open source knowledge, the commercial data source that they license, the proprietary data that they captured. None of this is usable by, by us as individuals anymore. So there has to be some, some filter that allows that to be useful, and that's what AI allows uh, to happen. Maria, I want to ask of you the exact same question. Let's assume that this technology works exactly as predicted what then. So when I think about the possibilities of telecommuting, on the one hand, I think this is, this is a future we should absolutely wish for. I mean, if you look at psychological studies, one of the things that most clearly correlates with negative affect is spending too much time in your daily commute. So you cut that down, your commute isn't you know, an hour there, an hour back. Instead, it's the walk from the bedroom to the living room. That's awesome. At the same time, do you worry about the sort of dissolution of work culture, of office culture that could happen when too many people feel like they don't need to come into the office and they, they can essentially just work alone? Or do you think that that, that, that concern is a little bit overblown because of the benefits? I, I think there's going to be this cultural shift where communities are built, and we need community, right? Like that isolation does, it doesn't work. We, we are community building people. And uh, that community will work with remote teams. And we see there are companies out there today that are working fully in remote. And they have, I, I saw, I read it in an article the other day, it's like the, the chief community officer for people who are like really fully in remote. And they build their own ways of, of doing. Like you asked me like what, what, if we are successful, what? Well, I will tell you, I will be working from Spain. Mm -hmm. My social fabric will be still intact in Spain, and I was still working at the headquarters of Facebook, which is based in, in Menlo Park. That's the future that you know, we can build together. Like People can access education, people can access the jobs, people can access what they need from where they have their you know, the dear ones without needing uh, to relocate. We also see that you know, people who relocate, uh, the ones who have uh, mobility, uh, job mobility, are the ones who get the better opportunities. And it's usually the you know, women and people who don't have the, the economic opportunity, the ones who are like, left behind. So this technology can be a you know, level the play field and allow uh, more qualitarian distribution of opportunities for everybody. And, um, and that would be an amazing thing for the world. Meredith, last question to you before we turn to the audience. Um, you know, a lot of the technologies that we're talking about can complement work, but eventually if they get good enough, they can also replace workers. Um, are there hidden costs to technology replacing workers where sometimes it just seems like you swap out the human, you put in the software, you press play, and you're good to go? Uh, what, what are the complications that you see arising sometimes when people take that next step to not just, the, not just complementing work, but replacing it? So one of the things I think about is I think about the fact that we're not making any fewer human beings in the world. Like work is really useful. Work is one of the ways we relate to each other. 
Uh, and honestly, nobody wants this utopia or this this imagined digital utopia of uh, of Ready Player One, where everybody sits home by themselves and exists in this virtual world alone. Like we actually want to be with other people. We're social creatures. And one of the things we've discovered in the uh, co-working revolution, for example, is that we thought that we were going to allow people to work remotely and that people were gonna work from home. But I mean, I've worked from home for a really long time. It's really lonely. So you wanna be around other people, which is why we have now the popularity of co-working spaces, right? So we had this fantasy that everybody was going to be able to work from anywhere. But the reality is, you know, we have a corporeal reality. Everybody has to work from somewhere. And we want to be around other people. So we should design a world that allows us to, you know, to physically be together. Yeah. We do have a corporeal reality, but eventually Igor will invent me as a device. Right, the pocket. digital Derek. So yeah, future me will not have a corporeal reality, but <laughs> for now, you can hold on. Uh, first question is, a. Uh, uh, Community colleges have used this technology, I'm assuming a virtual reality, to open welding programs in small strip mall storefronts. How can we make this tech more accessible in more places? So the future is here, it's just une unevenly distributed. Um, how do we make sure that VR technology, if it does work, um, is distributed equitably? Um, well, that's what we are working on. Um, you know, some of the, this is the reasons why I'm so excited to be Oculus for Business to be part of Oculus, where it is a consumer scale first, like Oculus Quest, which is, you know, gaming and entertainment first, uh, is, is working beautifully and we can, we sell them as fast as we made them. Uh, so that's going to provide like a scale, it's going to accelerate improving all of these technologies and it's a very affordable price. It's like, you know, the consumer version is like $400 for an all-in headset, you don't need the PC, you don't need anything. Um, in terms of like in the workplace, it's already being very affordable. Like for example, Walmart uses to train their, their, their workforce. They train one million people in VR every year. Mm -hmm. So it's already in every Walmart store, they have headsets where the people are trained. So it's starting to get like, you know, little by little everywhere, but it's just like really, we are really starting to see the, the, the opportunities for this yeah. uh, technology. Next question. Uh, it's a good question uh, to Meredith on isolation of VR workers in pajamas, but what value do these workers even add? Um, I will briefly defend the value of pajamaed workers. I often write <laughs> uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, but I'll tweak the question to say, um, is there a danger, the same way that you said that some of the benefits to office community are attenuated with the introduction of VR, could you also see productivity diminished if more people are essentially just working on their own outside the watchful eye of their bosses and they're all just distributed and taking care of themselves? Are there any risks to productivity that we see here? Open to the, the whole panel. Are there, any are there any downsides to a fully distributed workforce essentially where people are working virtually from their living rooms and from uh, co-working spaces and the concept of a corporate headquarters mm -hmm. diminishes over time. I think that if we talk about remote work as we know it today, yes, you know, there is this isolation, there is the, there is the non-official communication that happens when you are in the office, right? Like, what is the priority? What are people talking about? Who is influential? Who is not? And that you can't have when you are working with today's tools in, in remote collaboration. This is why we're excited about the future, but it's not something that we, ha we have available today. This is something that we are working towards because we need to be able to replicate that community, that office space, that virtual headquarters that where that communication, non-official communication, non-established, non-structured communication is able to circulate and you have a solution for that. Great. Um, that's all we have time for today. Thank you all very, very much and thank my panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.